and I'd like to welcome you to the Inamori Forum of the Blavatnik School of Government to what is for us a very, very special two days when we celebrate the Kyoto Prizes with the Inamori Foundation, whom we're thrilled to have here with us today. This school was founded eight years ago with a mission to improve government. Because government is this curious thing that humans have invented and designed in order that human beings can come together and excel, in order that human beings can live together and collectively pursue things that they couldn't do on their own. And the Kyoto Prize takes that to a whole new level, where by awarding prizes for advanced technology in basic sciences and in the arts and philosophy, they celebrate just how brilliant, how innovative, how creative human beings can be when they live in conditions which permit them to, to, to be so. And those conditions require good government. And it's the values of coming together, of working for the good of humankind that have really brought the Inamori Foundation and the Blavatnik School together in this partnership. So I just wanted to say how proud and thrilled we are to be able to celebrate the fantastic achievements that the Kyoto Prize rewards and how we see this as one of the most important things that our mission of improving government through teaching and through research and through engagement can make possible for human beings around the world. We are joined today, and I'd like also to welcome outside of this room, we're joined by three communities of faculty and students. First in Australia, at the Australian National University, we have an, an audience, and I'd like to welcome you, those of you in Australia who are up in the evening, um, joining us today. Secondly, in China, at Tsinghua University School of Public Policy and Management, we're delighted to have you joining us this morning. And finally, in Nigeria, at the Lagos School of Business, we're, we're very pleased to have you joining us. So those of you who are in this room know that you're part of a global community taking part in this, in this Kyoto Prize lecture series today. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Oxford um, to the stage, formally to welcome all of you, Louise Richardson. Very good morning to you all and to those of you uh, in Australia, China and Nigeria. I I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to the second Quixote Prize at Oxford. It is a particular pleasure to be joined once again by our friends from the Inamuri Foundation. And in particular, Mrs. Inamuri Kawazawa, it is our great honor to was our great honor to welcome your father to last year's inaugural event. Then, as now, we met in the Blavatnik School of Government. There's one notable difference, however. Today, we meet in the wonderfully named space named in Dr. Inamori's honor, the Inamori Forum, which is the beating heart of the Blavatnik School. Dr. Inamori will always be held in special esteem here in Oxford, and I hope that you will return to Japan carrying our warm greetings and sincere good wishes to him. We are indebted to Dr. Inamori for his visionary foresight and generosity in acknowledging that the future of humanity can be assured only through a balance of scientific progress and spiritual depth. I would wish more of today's leaders would remember this. It is to all our benefit to recognize that wonderful scientific and technological advances must not be at the expense of an ongoing examination of the human spirit and condition. Since the earliest days of its foundation, the University of Oxford has been an outward-looking and forward-thinking institution that has sought to enlighten and inspire through scholarship and education. Our first international student, Imo of Friesland, came to study here in 1190, 
and we have been welcoming foreign students and scholars from across the world ever since. Our first Japanese book arrived at the Bodleian Library in 1629, and the first Japanese scholars came to us at the end of the 19th century. So we are delighted to have such an enduring and enriching relationship with Japan. As we know, we live in challenging times. Today's world seems simultaneously smaller and yet more difficult to navigate than ever before. We live in an age of precarious geopolitics and fake news. We are concerned about a diverse range of problems from climate change to disease and healthcare provision, human rights abuses, inequality of opportunity, and misuse of natural and man-made resources. Faced with such challenges, we value strong links with those who share our commitment to pursuing knowledge and working collaboratively to make the world a better, safer, and more equitable place. The founding values of the Quixote Prize reflect the core ideals of the University of Oxford. When Dr. Inamuri created the prize in 1984, he wrote that it should be awarded to those who have made outstanding contributions to the progress of science, the advancement of civilization, and the enrichment and elevation of the human spirit. I think it speaks clearly to Dr. Inamuri's priorities that he also expressed the hope that the awards might, quote, redress the relative lack of formal recognition for highly dedicated but unsung researchers. This is music to the ears of all who have ever toiled away in lonely libraries and laboratories or turned down holiday treats in favor of completing a paper or a grant submission. It is such individual dedication and achievement that has earned this year's prize winners their well-deserved recognition. We are delighted that all three of you are with us here today. And I would like to take this opportunity to extend the very warmest of welcomes to Dr. Farquhar, Dr. Mamura, and Dr. Tarushkin. They each in their respective fields embody Dr. Mori's founding philosophy, and I know that their special addresses will both enlighten us today and stimulate discussion in the days to come. Here at Oxford, we are particularly proud of the range and depth of our scholarship and teaching across our four divisions, medical sciences, humanities, social sciences, and mathematical, physical, and life sciences. Having this year's Quixote Prize winners with us in Oxford is a wonderful opportunity, both to learn from them and to share with them some of the research that has been conducted right here, right now. I know that there are faculty members, researchers, and graduate students in plant sciences, physics, materials, and music who are greatly looking forward to their time with our prize winners tomorrow. On which note, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all formally to Oxford. I hope you will find the next two days enlightening, enriching, and enjoyable. Thank you very much. Well, I'd now like to invite the first of the Kyoto Prize laureates, Professor Graham Farquhar, to present his address. Pro Professor Graham Farquhar trained in Australia, at, did his BA in, at the University of Queensland, did his doctorate at the Australian National University, and he's rightly very uh, honoured in his own homeland. I, I, the first thing I read about you, Graham, was that you'd been made Senior Australian of the Year <laughs> just this year. Congratulations on that. But he's also been awarded the Prime Minister's Prize for Science and been honored by the Australian Academy of Sciences. But as the Vice-Chancellor said, the Kyoto Prize takes that recognition to a global audience, which you've already reached in your own field, and we hope um, others will be able to, you know, you'll reach even further and others will be able to enjoy your work. Uh, our, one of our foremost scientists this morning said, Professor Graham Fark was the inspiration for his work. We're delighted to have you here, and if I could invite you to come and give the first of the Kyoto Prize Laureate Lectures of this year. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Woods, Vice-Chancellor, uh, Mrs. Inamori Kazawa, Inamori Foundation, audiences in Nigeria, China, Australia, fellow 
laureates who have heard this several times. Ladies and gentlemen, it was a great honour to receive the Kyoto Prize for Basic Science for 2017 in the field of biological sciences. I am very grateful to the Inamori Foundation for having chosen me. I'm also very happy to have this opportunity to present what we've been doing over the past 49 years in environmental biophysics and plant physiology, and slightly nervous about the last part of my title, observing the shaping of policies. Much of my talk is the same as I gave in Kyoto last November and in San Diego this March. I was asked to stray into the policy side of this presentation to better meet the interests of our Oxford hosts. I might say I think it was a good thing to do. <laughs> when plants started extensively colonising the land in the Devonian 420 million years ago, they gained access to light and nutrients. Uh, we don't have to keep looking at me and my wonderful car. They ex plants exposed themselves to the danger of desiccation. They evolved a waterproof outer cuticle with small openings called stomata to allow and control the rate of and the inward diffusion of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Inevitably, water vapor escapes from the leaf through the, through the stomata when they are open. This is shown in both of these pictures. The first picture was of a dicot leaf, and the second one. Oops. The second one shows uh, what it's like inside a, a wheat leaf. Anyway, this introduces a fundamental dilemma for plants. How to organize the stomatal opening in such a way that somehow carbon dioxide uptake is, is maximal, but water loss is minimal. This dilemma and the ways in which plants have solved it is fundamental to plant success and is a basic feature determining ecosystem organization and agricultural crop yield. But first, my own origins and evolution as a plant scientist. I was born in 1947 in Hobart, the capital of Tasmania. That makes me the first Kyoto Prize winner born in Oceania. My, my mother was a primary school teacher until I was born, and my father was studying agricultural science. After graduating, my father became an agricultural extension agent in the Huon Valley, south of Hobart, taking scientific developments to farmers and presumably informing the scientists of successful initiatives, informing the scientists of successful initiatives by the farmers, because it's a two-way street between farmers and scientists. In about 1951, we moved from, Burnie to, from Hobart to Burnie on Tasmania's northwest coast. Dad still worked as an extension agent. The element molybdenum had been identified as being deficient in Australian soils, and he, he carried bags of molybdenum fertilizer in the trunk of his car so that farmers could spread it on, the, on their fields. Sometimes he'd be given bags of potatoes by grateful farmers. Five years later, we moved to Melbourne, and Dad started working for the Australian government's scientific research organization called the CSIRO. And then he was awarded fellowships to study at Cornell University, where he received his EDD, a Doctor of Education. In 1960, we returned to Melbourne with, with broadened horizons. I went to a public high school for one year, and then on scholarship to a private school for four years. At the high school, I met Richard Richards, who later would become a scientific collaborator. As a child, I often had asthma, particularly in the spring, and when I was 14, I was confined to bed for a week. Returning from a trip to the US, my father gave me a text on biology, saying that biophysics was the new, exciting, emerging discipline analogous to biochemistry. Apart from it being an application of physics to biology, we knew little about it. In retrospect, it could as easily have been the application of biology to physics. Anyway, the, the novelty appealed to me, and I read the text with interest. 
Dad sought advice from Ralph Slatcher, then a leading CSIRO scientist working on plant water relations, and Ralph said I should study physics first and then pick up the needed biology. At the end of 1963, my mathematics master advised me to, advised me to take terminal mathematics as he assessed that I had no aptitude for it. <laughs> Stubbornly, I chose to do the two mathematics courses for those students who wanted to become scientists. My scholarship at the private school allowed me to repeat the 12th grade, and I took a couple of courses, namely social studies and biology, outside the usual classes needed for straight physical sciences. I did well in both, and that gave me some confidence that I could return to biology after a degree in physics and mathematics. I also repeated the mathematics with a different teacher. Whether it was the more creative teaching or my own mathematical maturing, I did better now in mathematics. Piaget's work showing that we all go through developmental stages in learning, for example, mathematics, had not yet been published. Ready to go to college, I enrolled at the then recently founded Monash University. In the summer of 1966-67, after my first year, I worked at the CSRO Division of Chemical Physics as a laboratory technician with the aim of improving the electrons used in electron microscopes. I worked on both practical and theoretical aspects, but I don't think I made much progress in either. Nevertheless, one of the scientists casually mentioned one day that I would make a good scientist, as I had the right temperament. I took this right to heart especially in my second and third years, where some of the physics courses seemed so far from being relevant to biology. I also took a lot of interest in other non-academic pursuits. I may not have been getting the best marks, but I was going to make a good scientist. Or thus I defended and protected myself. Looking back at the classes, a class that seemed rather less structured than, for example, the theory of electricity and magnetism, was later of great value to my thinking. He was led by a senior professor named Street. He wanted us to be able to make rough estimates, ballpark estimates of physical phenomena. A woman walks into a room, how long roughly before you can smell her perfume? A tennis player hits a ball with a racket, approximately how much do the strings bend? That way of thinking is embedded in my brain now, and now I've become very quick and almost automated at mentally checking magnitudes of numbers particularly those associated with data on photosynthesis or water use. At the end of 1967, my father was moved to Canberra. So after, after two years at Monash, in 1968, I enrolled at the Australian National University for third year physics and mathematics. I was starting to, to yearn for the biological applications. I was struck that there were separate departments of physics and theoretical physics. This made me wonder whether theoretical biophysics would ever be a recognized field. Changing universities, having to make new friends, and failing to see how all the physics would help my future career in biophysics, I didn't apply myself fully and performed poorly in the exams. I had been warned by the best students in the year that I needed to work harder. There was only one unit in which I did well, thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, which happened to be the only unit that had an open book exam. I still find thermodynamics difficult, but statistical treatments make more sense. I would get my degree, but only be allowed to, conti to continue to fourth year or honours at ANU if I worked on shock tubes, the physics department research specialty at the time, but so far from biology. I saw an advertisement for a fourth year scholarship in biophysics at the University of Queensland, my field, and it was offering an Australian $1,500 a year salary. This was 1969, and Armstrong and Aldrin work, walked on the moon in July. I won one of the scholarships and thus began the real transition to, to biology. We did introductory courses in plant physiology, biochemistry, and membrane biophysics. I was offered a research project to measure the humidity inside a leaf, which would have involved inserting wet and dry bulb psychrometers through a stomatal pore. When I worked out that the typical pore dimension are a few micrometers, I knew from my experience welding wires for, elect for electron microscopes that the proposed project was impossible, so I changed supervisors. 
The research project I was next given was on bioelectricity in plants, my plant being a jungle liana. The best thing that year was that I met Professor Champ Tanner, a member of the United States National Academy of Sciences and an expert on soil physics and micrometeorology, who was on sabbatical in Queensland from, from Wisconsin. I was welcomed into his family by his wife Katie and three of his children. I didn't graduate with first class honours, the overall assessment being that I was a dilettante. But it, I don't know why they thought I was a dilettante. But I did gain a PhD scholarship to join Ralph Thatcher's new Department of Environmental Biology in the Research School of Biological Sciences part of the Institute of Advanced Studies at the ANU. In retrospect, I was lucky. I doubt whether I would be given the opportunity to, to, today to do a PhD without a first class honours degree. I suspect that the opportunity came in the form of a reference letter that Champ Tanner sent to Ralph Thatcher. Champ also offered me a PhD scholarship in Madison, Wisconsin, but I wanted to return to Canberra. Nevertheless, I did learn quite a bit in my years spent in Brisbane. After my near miss in third year physics at Canberra, I was determined that I should spend at least 35 hours a week on biophysics, the same amount of time as other workers spent on their jobs. I tried to keep track of the amount of time I was really working and ignored time spent daydreaming, chatting, walking, eating, doing administration, not that I had much of that, and discovered that I was well short of 35. It was only when I immersed myself writing up the honours thesis that the numbers picked up and I made scientific progress. Another piece of luck in 1969 was that one evening I snuck into a theatre halfway through a performance by a touring group of Bolshoi dancers. I was thrilled by them and the next night paid for two tickets to take a friend. Back at ANU in 1970, I was immersed in a first-rate research atmosphere that environmental biology exemplified. I learned to peel the epidermis of leaves and studied the opening and closing of stomata, the holes in the leaf epidermis. Ian Cowan, a physicist, became my supervisor. In my first meeting with him, he asked me what my ambition was for my PhD and for my research. I replied that I, I wanted to make the desert bloom. Of course, I, I cringe today. Ian said that he thought that was a wonderful ambition, but wondered to me what was going to get me out of bed on a Tuesday. We agreed I should work on stomata. Ian was working on the relative role of stomata in CO2 assimilation and transpiration. An important characteristic of a photosynthesizing leaf is to mild conductances, which is basically the ratio of flux of water vapor out of the leaf, the transpiration rate, to the gradient of water vapor, water vapor concentration driving it. He had seen stomatal conductance oscillate with a period of about 40 minutes and had published the results. I too had seen damped oscillations in the short circuit currents that I'd measured in my liana in Queensland. I took the time to write up the paper with my former supervisor and we submitted it to Nature. The editor, the editor wrote a warm, courteous letter suggesting to us that it might be better suited to a more specialised journal. Couldn't he see how interesting it was? We had more luck with the Journal of Experimental Botany. My first paper was based on my bachelor's thesis, which is not bad for a dilettante. Ian was working on a model of the mechanism of stomatal oscillations and published a brilliant paper on the topic in 1972. In the same year, he also published on heat and mass transfer in the leaf boundary layer and was also busy working on the micrometeorology of grapevines. We agreed that I should develop an apparatus to measure whole plant gas exchange, characterize the conditions under which os oscillations occurred, and then perform an engineering style analysis of the stable stomatal system by perturbing humidity sinusoidally. This involved working closely for months with a wonderful self-trained technician, Eric McGruddy, as an aside, I noticed that he, tells, he told me that he was the only person he knew who had worked both for the IRA and the UK government at the same time. He, anyway, we built our racetrack, a closed loop wind tunnel, where the rate of transpiration was measured by the amount of dry air that had to be added to keep the, the humidity constant. 
and the rate of CO2 assimilation was measured by the amount of carbon dioxide that had to be added to keep its concentration constant. I nearly killed Eric one day when I supplied electrical power to the wrong component when he was working on it. He was so experienced, thank goodness, that by habit he first touched things with the back of his hand and it threw his hand off. You'll never get a PhD, he, he often said affectionately, but thanks to him I did. Nevertheless, at one stage in 1971, I was convinced that the PhD was a lost cause. Peter Hopmans in Holland published an 80, 86, yeah, 86, 86 page opus on stomatal rhythms, including nearly all the kinds of data that I had been gathering. It was a disaster, I thought. Funnily enough, it prompted us to do something completely novel. Ian suggested that we try to break the feedback loop involving stomatal conductance and transpiration rate. If we, had an off, if we had an oscillating system, could we, by modifying the humidity, wrest control of a transpiration rate away from stomatal conductance, and would a constant transpiration rate then cause the stomatal conductance to stabilize? It was a tough thing to achieve experimentally, but it worked. I always tell that story to students and postdocs. When you've been scooped, meaning somebody else is publishing what you're working on, it saves you time from, from writing up what others have already published and forces you to be more creative. I did examine the responses of cotton stomata to sinusoidal perturbations of humidity and of CO2. In writing up the thesis, I speculated in a primitive way about optimal stomatal behavior. If, opti if stomatal conductance were were optimal, then I argued that the positive benefit in terms of increased CO2 assimilation if stomata were to open slightly must be somehow balanced by a negative benefit or a cost of increased evaporation rate. Ian said he didn't really follow the argument, which was a real worry to me as he was the smartest person I'd ever met, but that I should keep it in the, in the thesis and the latter was submitted and finally passed in May 1973. In parallel with all this science, I had an unusual hobby. After seeing the Bolshoi in Brisbane and returning to Canberra, I started learning classical ballet uh, in 1970, at the same time as I started my PhD. I made great friends and I organized the dance program from, a, I started a dance group at the university, National University Dance Ensemble, or NUDE for short. And I organized the dance program for, for, for a festival of university arts involving dance groups from around Australia and performed in a mime piece myself. The combination of dance and biophysics was a good one. Before leaving for a postdoctoral position in the United States, I gave a dedicated copy of my thesis to my ballet teachers, Brian Lawrence and Janet Curran. Again, I was lucky. I had, had only one publication with nothing published yet from my PhD. And yet somehow I had a contract to work at Michigan State University in a first-rate laboratory for my new supervisor, Klaus Raschke. My trip to Michigan was wonderful. Singapore, Hong Kong, Tokyo, by plane, then a boat from Yokohama to Nakhodka, near Vladivostok, train to Khabarovsk, and by hard class on the Trans-Siberian Railway to Moscow, with stops at Irkutsk, near Lake Baikal, and Novosibirsk. We're on, a, we're on an enormously wide stage. I saw the ballet Romeo and Juliet with music by Prokofiev. I went to the Bolshoi Theatre in Moscow and the Kirov Theatre in Leningrad. I took the train to Warsaw and East Berlin and then Paris and flights to London and finally to East Lansing where I arrived in time for July 4th celebrations, 1973. Klaus, my new supervisor, was the world leader in research on stomata and a superb experimentalist. He urged me to publish my PhD thesis as a whole under my own name, but I felt that would be unfair to Ian Cowan. I did write up the work with Ian on oscillations and the feedback involved, involved in water relations. It was published in 1974 in Plant Physiology. My first task at the MSU Plant Research Lab was to review experiments that my supervisor had already done. They appeared to show that there was a resistance to transpiration that was sensitive to carbon dioxide concentration, but Klaus himself was suspicious. This was not the nicest way to start a relationship, with me having to ask all sorts of skeptical questions about his experimental techniques. But Klaus's suspicions were well founded and I confirmed that the interpretation of the results was not correct. 
In Canberra, most gas exchange data were accumulated on ink chart recorders, although we had toward the end used a primitive analogue computer. All the, in that analogue computer, all the fittings were made of gold. Beautiful. Anyway, Klaus gave me the job of connecting his gas exchange system to a new digital computer. I drove to San Francisco in my blue Opal GT to learn how the computer and some of its peripherals worked. When the system arrived, it was the size of two large filing cabinets. Klaus had paid an extra paid extra money for a 50% memory enhancement. And this brought us up from eight kilobytes to 12 kilobytes. That's kilobytes, not megabytes, not gigabytes, but kilobytes. Each change to the program involved passing about a dozen paper tapes. To be able to follow experiments in detail as they happened, though, made it all worthwhile. It was a real boon, much more mentally stimulating than calculating the results days later. The time in Michigan started passing more quickly. I was promoted to a research specialist. I saw a lot of my Tanner family in Madison and enjoyed occasional weekends in Chicago, whose art museum I loved. I danced with the MSU orchestra's group and also with the Lansing Ballet. In 1974, I went to New York City and started taking classes there for a couple of weeks but recognised that as a dancer I made a wonderful plant biophysicist. I was just lucky that males at that time had many more opportunities in dance than males have today, or than women had then and now. I received a letter from Ian Cowan. In, a, in an elegant manner, he had solved the problem of optimality of stomatal behaviour. He showed that for a given amount of water transpired in a day, the greatest uptake of CO2 requires that DDA equals R dash where R dash, he generously acknowledges in what became his 1977 opus, was the same as my Pierre in my thesis. So I was keen to get back to Canberra. I applied for a job at CSRO in Canberra, but didn't get it. Then a position as a research fellow was advertised in Ralph Slatcher's department at the university. I applied and it was a tie with another young scientist, Dave Sheriff. Both of us were subsequently hired and we got one research technician to share. I said goodbye to Klaus, of whom I'd grown quite fond. We continued to work together via snail mail and we eventually published four research papers together in 1978. I remained close friends with him and his family and visited him in 2016. Before going back to Australia, I stopped in Germany and I worked for a month with Ian Cowan, who was on sabbatical leave there in, in Würzburg. We continued to refine our theory of optimal stomatal behaviour. Since the theory depended on knowing what the rate of photosynthesis would be if stomatal conductance were different from what it was actually at the time, we had to develop a mathematical model of photosynthesis. And Ian suggested that I probably ought to do this as part of my work in my new position. To, de to de develop a model for a process such as photosynthesis, you need to take into account the various factors that could be limiting the process. In our case, these included the rate of CO2 diffusion into the leaf through the open stomata, the rate that the rubisco enzyme can react with the CO2, and the supply of energy in the form of electrons in the chloroplast. Once back at the ANU, I drew up plans for an automated gas exchange system like that of Klaus, where photosynthesis and transpiration could be measured separately on the two sides of a leaf. While we waited for access to machinists and other technical support, I used a potometer, P-O-T-O -O meter, basically a tube connected to a plant stem where the rate of water uptake is monitored by measuring the speed of movement of a bubble through a capillary tube. I examined the effects of the hormone of cystic acid on stomatal responses to humidity. In writing it up, I inquired about statistical tests needed to accompany the results and was told that I needed a model of the process. I presume that they must have, in retrospect, I realised it was probably a statistical model they wanted, but anyway, I developed a mechanistic model, a feed-forward model, and published it. We never published the data, unfortunately. Meanwhile, a brilliant PhD student arrived from Singapore, Chin Wong, and he took over the construction of the gas exchange equipment. The opportunity to think more about a mathematical description of photosynthesis came when Barry Osmond, as the new professor of environmental biology at the ANU, hosted, hosted a visit from Joe Berry from the Carnegie Institution at Washington. As, uh, Carnegie Institute of Washington at Stanford. 
Joe and I discussed an approach to modelling and conceived the notion of treating the process as being like what Joe called a teeter-totter, or what you here in the UK and we in Australia call a seesaw, where the control was rested by the process most limiting, whether it was the supply of energy for regeneration of IVP or the Rubisco enzyme limited rate of catalysis. We developed equations for energy demand in terms of ATP based on the most recent, recent research, and Joe presented these ideas at the 1977 Photosynthesis Congress in, here in England, emphasising the results obtained with plants that have the C4 pathway of photosynthesis. C3 photosynthesis has obviously deserved a more detailed treatment, and I started working on that, but there were distractions. Ian said that in order to get a permanent or tenured position, I needed to publish on some topic in which he was not involved. I chose to investigate the exchange of ammonia between plants and the atmosphere, given the importance we gave to its flux in the photorespiratory cycle that accompanied oxygenation of IVP rather than the famous Calvin cycle that accompanies the carboxylation of IVP. Further, Chin Wong in our research group was making beautiful measures that suggested a message being sent from the stomata, from the mesophyll to the stomata. I'm behind. And, and yet that, that work was published in Nature, which is good. Importantly, <laughs> importantly, I was dancing again, and I co-founded the Canberra Dance Ensemble, which later became today's Canberra Dance Theatre. I continued to work on the modelling of photosynthesis. I realised that conventional descriptions of enzyme kinetics, which assume that the enzyme concentration is vanishingly small, could not apply in vivo to Rubisco, the first enzyme in CO2 assimilation, because its concentration in the chloroplast is very high. I developed and published a mathematical treatment. A competitor visited our lab and he surprised us by writing a manuscript and offering me co-authorship. But Joe and I wanted our own paper and we were now motiv motivated to move faster with treatment of electron transport and its dependence on light intensity and expressions for quantum yield compensation point. Meanwhile, Susanna von Kammerer, who was majoring in pure mathematics, first worked as a summer student and then decided to do a PhD in our lab. After working for some time on leaf movement, Susanna decided that she would like to test the predictions of the photosynthesis model, which was rather daring given that her background included little relevant ex experimental experience. Eventually, we, that's with Susanna and Joe Berry, published a paper in 1980 on our model, and this helped me get, get a promotion and get tenure, so it's a great paper. I had thought I was relaxed about tenure until I actually got it, and I astonished myself with the relief that I felt. It's amazing that insecurity can be deep and irrational. Our paper was initially controversial. Susanna's experiments, published in 1981, supported the ideas. We then published a fuller treatment in 1982, Tom Sharkey, a new postdoctoral fellow who came from the US, suggested another limitation to photosynthesis beyond that of the activity of Rubisco itself and of energy reductance supply, and that was triose phosphate utilization limitation. If the products of photosynthesis exported from the chloroplast, the sugar phosphates, are not used, phosphate is no longer released in the cytoplasm and the chloroplast becomes starved of phosphorus. Another thing that had been developing in my research, that of isotope, was uh, isotope discrimination. Carbon and CO2 exist in two forms, mostly 12 CO2, C12, and a tiny bit of 13 CO2. The heavier form diffuses a little bit slower, but also reacts with the Rubisco quite a lot more slowly. Basically, the principle was that if gaseous diffusion through the stomata were limiting photosynthesis, the discrimination would be small, but if diffusion placed no limitation, the Rubisco should fractionate a lot, with 13 CO2 left behind, able to diffuse back out of the leaf. We saw that it was a way of roughly estimating genetic and physiological differences between plants. Our theoretical paper was published in 1982. This is Marin O'Leary, who was an excellent, or is an excellent pianist. And together with experimental support, Marilyn Ball, who was another student. 
Actually, as an aside, I noticed that both Susanna and Marilyn are fellows of the Australian Academy of Science. I'm very proud of that. And Susanna is now a fellow of the Royal Society. And there are not many women who have done so well, so it's, it's a point of great pride on my part. Anyway, meanwhile, on a relaxing weekend walk through a park on the banks of Canberra's Lake Burley Griffin, I ran into Richard Richards whom I had known in high school in 1962, and we discovered that we had professional interests in common. Richard was and is a wheat breeder at CSIRO. He had wheat varieties that had contrasting body efficiency measured on plants growing in pots and measured in two contrasting seasons. He'd kept some dried leaves and we were able to combust them and measure the carbon isotopic composition. We plotted the results as they slowly appeared from the mass spectrometer agreeing with the theory to a fair approximation. We celebrated with champagne. There was something magical and mysterious about the link between ideas, their, their mathematical expression, and the material results, in our case, of, of activities like sowing wheat seeds, measuring plant growth, measuring wood use, and that sort of composition. But that, that link between something being explored in your brain, something being written down in mathematical form and something actually coming to fruition in the material world. It's, it's really quite strange when you think about it. Anyway, that began, thus began a long collaboration with Richard and his team, including Tony Condon, who did a PhD jointly with Richard and me, and Greg Rubetsky, a quantitative geneticist, as they surveyed wheat lines per variation and isotope composition, chose a line with low discrimination, which corresponded to high water use efficiency, and back crossed it into a commercial wheat line. The process generated a lot of interest, a lot of science, and eventually the commercial release in 2002 of the first variety of bread in the program that Richard named Drysdale. Now, Drysdale, you could be excused for thinking dry meaning desiccated and dale meaning a desiccated field, but Drysdale was actually a famous Australian artist. Other notable, notable developments since 1984 included work on Patchy's tomato with Ichiro Terashima in 1988, the dependencies of photosynthesis and transpiration and water loss on stomata opening are nonlinear, and so one cannot simply average the assimilation rates of two stomata conductances as being that expected at the average conductance. We started thinking on larger scales and worked with John Lloyd and what vegetation in the ocean did to isotopologues of atmospheric CO2 in both, involving both 13C and 18O. The latter, the latter published in Nature in 1993. In this case, we were lucky as one of the referees was a brilliant young biogeochemist, Ralph Keeling from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, who helped host me last month in San Diego. We extended the leaf photosynthesis treatment to the crop canopy with David DePuy in 1997. Once again, the lesson was that lumping of elements of a model that needs care when there are nonlinearities. I had earlier worked out the mathematical condition that one could simply scale from the chloroplast to the stationary leaf, provided the amount of photosynthetic machinery was proportional to the absorbed light density locally. And I was keen to extend that idea to the crop. Luckily, being careful, David saw the danger. To be specific, the leaves at the bottom of a short canopy might spend 90% of the time in full shade and 10% of the time in sunplex but that would not yield the same average rate of photosynthesis as being always a 10% of full sunlight. Mike Roderick and I were struck that evaporative demand was going down around the world at the same time as the globe was warming. We commented in the journal Science that in some parts of the world this could be due to reduction of sunlight by aerosols or global dimming. But then by examining the records in Australia and applying the same formula for evaporation from a pan of water as we applied to a leaf, we later showed that over land, the reduction was mainly due to declining wind speeds. The, declining, the declines in wind speed over land are massive, and their causes are obscure. We, we call that global stilling. With Joseph Marl, we identified the first gene affecting carbon isotope discrimination in both the numerator and denominator of transformation efficiency, i.e. both photosynthetic capacity and stomatal density, that was published in Nature in 2005. Many of these papers derived to some extent from the modelling of photosynthesis. Other people, of course, have also applied and extended the model. For example, in crop models, it is used to predict how the canopy photosynthesis would respond to changes in the biochemical makeup of the plants. 
Steve Long here today is, is such an expert. The majority, 9 out of 11, of current global climate models observe, uh, uses some form of a I, there'll be a test on this slide at the end of the. I just just proof that it's used. The model is used in nine out of 11, nine out of eleven. Housewives recommend our model. This aids further understanding of sources and sinks of carbon dioxide. Further, via Chin's empirical observation that stomatal conductance correlates with photosynthesis, it's used to model the surface fluxes of water and heat solving for surface temperatures in weather forecasting models in Europe and elsewhere. We're still developing the model with Florian Bush and Rowan Sage. We, re we recently published a paper in Nature Plants that examines the interaction between amino acid synthesis and photorespiration with implications for nitrogen nutrition and responses to increasing carbon dioxide levels. Next, we plan to, uh, to develop a more detailed model of light, light absorption electron transport and to start the bridge of the gap from modelling photosynthesis to modelling growth. Now for the promising, the promised observations on the shaping of policies. I've already mentioned the late Ralph Slatcher's early influences in my career. He was a source of advice for 45 years as he rose to become Australia's first chief scientist. He, he counselled me about dealing with government ministers, especially when I went to Kyoto in 1997. That's 20 years before the Kyoto Prize. In the same convention centre, at the same Prince Hotel, the Kyoto Protocol was negotiated in the same place that the Kyoto Prize was given. So that's rather lovely. Anyway, I went to Kyoto in 1997 as a science advisor to the Australian delegation and a delegate myself to the third conference of parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. I got there because with John Lloyd, we had won contracts with the National Greenhouse Gas Inventory to estimate greenhouse gas fluxes from land use change and forestry, LUCF. Our figures suggested a big drop in land clearing since 1990, and that was the baseline year of interest at the time. The drop was so large that it made Australia the best performing country in the OECD in terms of overall greenhouse accounting. No longer, of course. Prime Minister Howard had planned to tell Parliament that Australia would not be going to Kyoto until Ralph, Ralph Slatcher, now in, he'd, by that stage, had become the ex chief scientist, but was still influential. And he told him about figures just before Parliament sat. Our figures had gone to the Department of Environment but the negotiations were being largely run by foreign affairs and trade. The FCCC was, was like a trade negotiation in many ways. And DFAT neglected to pass on the information as they regarded it as insecure in magnitude, and I guess insecure in negotiating terms as well. The PM was furious at not being told and said that the delegation could go, but only if I was included. The UK had the chair for the EU at the time. Not happening much more, I guess. So the, the lead negotiator on land use change and forestry was the UK's Jim Pennon. The EU position at the time was to allow nothing to do with the sector to make it into the protocol. The Danes, for example, told me that getting credit for reducing land clearing it was like getting credit for not killing your grandmother. The wider EU position on LUCF was a fascinating one in terms of science and policy, and perhaps we could discuss that later. Jim personally was most helpful, and we worked well together. I, I can expand on that later if you like, on what eventually became Article 3.7, which just made it by the skin of its teeth into the Kyoto Protocol after midnight on the last night when the clock was stopped to make sure that we didn't go over time. Jim contacted me again in, 19, in 2016 about getting together again, but unfortunately he died not, uh, not long after. Several issues arose from the land use change and forestry negotiations, and I remained involved for a while, but it became a, it became a, cl a conflict of interest in my mind to attend meetings of SUBSTA, the FCCC subsidiary body for 
scientific and technological advice while also working on the IPCC uh, chapters and matters, I felt it was a conflict of interest and so I withdrew from the, from the government operation. In Kyoto, I'd worked with the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hill. On return, I wrote to him that we'd been lucky in Kyoto and that Australia would need a substantial effort to keep the LUCF figures accountable internationally. He agreed and a national carbon accounting system was set up with lots of people engaged to produce the LUCF figures that could withstand the closest scrutiny, scrutiny and my scientific life regained some normalcy. Thickening of vegetation became a threat to Article, Article 3.7, depending on one's view of whether it was directly human-induced, I, I, I'd argue that it was indirect. But anyway, I rang Ralph Thatcher for advice. His advice to me was to make the science clear and that tricky political issues were best handled by professional politicians. Perhaps that was an assessment of my own shortcomings and that he was extremely astute politically himself. As chief scientist, Ralph introduced the system of cooperative research centres, typically linking university and CSRO research with industry. He in turn followed the advice of Sir John Crawford, who always had a plan in his back pocket for how usefully to spend some money should some spring free. In Sir John's case, one example was when he produced plans for what became the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, when at short notice, Prime Minister Fraser wanted to focus for his hosting of a Chogham. Chogham, for those who don't, don't know, is Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Melbourne in 1981. I've got a beautiful picture here of the Chogham leaders with the Queen and the Duke on board the Britannia moored in Port Phillip Bay outside Melbourne. My own observations of policy development have obviously concentrated on science organisation and funding as well as issues like climate change. How are we going on time? Okay. I remember, I remember being asked by a shadow minister whether it was my opinion that CSRO, typically administratively linked to the Department of Science, when it exists, and the universities, typically in the Department of Education, whether they should be in the same Commonwealth Department. For a long time, I felt that I had felt it made no sense if one believed in a national scientist policy to have them separated. However, I surprised myself by answering that while I saw some obvious advantages, it was probably safer for science in the long term not have all its eggs in one basket and that a bit of biodiversity tends to, to save Australian science as a whole from the more extreme policy positions that some ministers occasionally take. The case for basic science is not necessarily guaranteed when it is funded by the Department of Industry. The same issues are obvious in Japan and no doubt elsewhere. It's a great subject for debate. Scientists are, one hopes, quantitative in their research. In my experience, it doesn't always apply to the funding of their research. For example, just how much of the budget should we spend on basic research? It's never enough. Uh, scientists that will, well, I don't know if a single scientist who will give you an upper bound on that number, apart from 100% or maybe 110. So senior scientists often end up making deals with administrators and politicians that promise more funding, provided it be spent according to some principle that supposedly has been missing up to that time. So provided the spending is in areas of national priority or filling some gap exposed by a science and technology mapping exercise. I've spent a good deal of my time traveling on government committees addressing both goals with outcomes so diffuse as to be of little value, ending up as more minor hurdles in grant applications. It's important to note that it's usually the administrators in the area concerned, they don't want to cut back the funds. They want to be able to spend more for, for good reasons, sound reasons. However, they need an, an excuse to justify the funds to their betters. Often the politicians are in the same position and they're seeking arguments to convince Treasury or Finance or the Cabinet or the party room or the electorate. 
time is such a precious commodity for researchers, and anything that frees it up a bit is a good investment. Anything that chews on it, chews C-H-E-W, deserves critical examination. It's commonly agreed that the seeking grant support is a huge sink for time for basic researchers. I've been struck that the most successful laboratories in plant science in the 1980s were those with some guaranteed level of support. I think of our own ANU Research School of Biological Sciences, the MSU DOE Plant Research Lab, the Carnegie Institution of Washington Plant Biology Lab at Stanford, the USDA ARS Labs at Urbana, in our, own, in our own case, we had virtually no access to competitive funding at the time. But if we had an idea for research, we would compare it with what we're doing at the, already, and if it were better, just change topic accordingly, mostly within the same budget, i.e. rarely with new money, but with minimum delay. Today, if the scientist has an idea, and if they're lucky, they think, that's a good idea for a grant proposal. So they do a grant proposal and they put it in, they wait to hear, and at the very least it's going to be a year or two later before they can start the work. I realise that this raises a lot of issues about, that I'm sure you must discuss in governance. Another aspect of funding that scientists are not quantitative about relates to how many academics share the pie. In most institutions I visit, new and extended buildings are planned to house labs, labs run by increased numbers of researchers who complain about reduced funding per academic. Are the rewards for producing masters and PhD graduates distorting the basic aims of teaching and research? Not to mention the nature of person power needed for the next decades. That's, that's a question. Returning to climate change policy, there are many facets. I was involved quite heavily with the IPCC and its processes. I was sufficiently impressed as to think that it would be a good idea to apply the same approach to the GMO debate, ge uh, genetically modified organisms. One obvious question is who would fund it? I was not the first to think of this idea, and the interesting thing is that those locked to one side or the other do not really want to go through such a process. On the one side, raising money from diffuse sources can sometimes be easier from an entrenched position and from one prepared to move following whatever the science delivers. I put the science in inverted commas as it is not set in stone, otherwise why would we be seeking money for climate change research or GMO research? The disappointing aspect of the IPCC reports for me has not been the detailed review of the scientific issues in working groups one and two, but how the summaries for policymakers rapidly became political and sometimes lacking balance. It is important in the long run for environmental scientists to be honest and not let, the, lead for, not, not, not let the, need, the need for funding distort the tweets and press releases associated with what one hopes is the real science. As an example, I think back to the publicised fears of rising water tables in the context of salinisation of agricultural lands. Soon after some funding was delivered in that area, those seeking funds for climate change research provoked fears of drought and lowering water tables. Well, it can't go in both directions at the same time. It is worth reflecting that the present decade probably has the greatest rate of global photosynthesis for many thousands of years. And our satellites say the savannas are greening the earth. Before ending, I would like to acknowledge some people who have significantly influenced my science. I've already spoken at length about Ralph Slatcher. I've mentioned Ian Cowan, who influenced me scientifically more than anybody else. He was a sounding board for any ideas that I had, but had so many of his own and was so far ahead of the field and was such a perfectionist about publishing that he created a fertile canopy of science for me to explore and, and, explore and exploit. He died recently and I was distraught as there are so many things outstanding that I intended to, to discuss with him. The late Cham Tanner, Klaus Rashka, Joe Berry, Chin Wong, my partner, Josette Mao, and our children, Sean, Ella, and Etienne. Thank you, Dr. Inamori, and the Foundation for this wonderful recognition and for the opportunity to talk with you all. So the final message for me is a simple one. I just thought about what has made a difference to me, what things have worked and what things haven't worked. And to me, 
important things in life are to struggle to improve, to struggle to be honest, and to struggle to reevaluate re one's prejudices. Thank you, everybody. Well, now an opportunity for your questions, and I'm joined here by Professor George Radcliffe, who's the Professor of Plant Sciences here at, at Oxford University, and we're thrilled to have you co-hosting our Kyoto Laureate with us. Your questions for um, Professor Farquhar. Yes, Diana. And do introduce yourself very briefly. We'll bring a microphone to you. Um, thank you so much for your sharing this morning because I just realized how similar our life stories are. I have a PhD from the University of Queensland in virology uh -huh. and I'm currently studying for a master uh, for public policy here in the school. Oh, wonderful. Um, so my question to you is about your comment about leaving the politics to the experts who know it. Um, I've worked in HIV AIDS um, as well as human papillomavirus, specifically in the gut, um, cervical cancer vaccine. Um, and so there's a lot of um, politics involved in actually implementing and putting policies forward for sexual reproductive health. I found that it is both my responsibility as a scientist who worked on it, researched it, and presenting the best evidence-based policy to the politicians but how best can we scientists kind of like talk in the same language as politics, as politicians and as economists um, to kind of like nudge them towards choosing these evidence-based policies mm. rather than something that would fit what their politics wants them to do? Mm. That's a really good question. I, 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 perhaps I should make it clear that that was the advice I got from Ralph Slatcher. Who said, who said not to do something that he did all the time. Um, I suppose, you know, having been involved in such a political thing as the Kyoto Protocol, I saw the problem when scientists didn't identify which hat they were wearing. This is particularly true after, after Kyoto, I went to, a, I remember going to an IPCC organi organising meeting and uh, John Zillman was there, who was the president of the World Meteorological Organisation. He he's, he's an Australian, he was head of the Bureau of Meteorology at the time. And so he had the United Nations hat, an Australian hat in terms of the, the Bureau, and various other hats. And I remember I could see jockeying from the various countries to see outcomes come through that would, that would look very similar to the, to the national political positions of those countries. And I, I mentioned to him, I said, surely we can't allow a country X to do that. That's just pushing their own political barrow. He said, Graham, don't say that. We're wearing different hats today. We're scientists and we judge it purely on science. And Somehow or other, he was able to, to do that remarkably well. But I do, I do take your point that, that obviously you want the facts to come out and you want policy to be based on, on, on good, solid scientific facts. All I'd ask is that when scientists do it, that they state very clearly when they're giving a fact based on their own experience as a scientist and they say what their expertise is, and very clearly label it when they come to a conclusion they want to take, suggest some political uh, outcome as a result, and that they never confuse the two things. Because it's too difficult for society if, if we... Scientists can only... Well, they won't be useful resources if they're just another interest group. 
So we've got to be more than just an interest group. We've got to be the source of data, the source of information, and the source of good advice. So, I mean, I see why you asked the question, and I can see that there are many cases where advice is given to government that doesn't include good, good science. But that should not be a reason for allowing us to forget our role and to be clear in stating our purpose in, 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 in forwarding advice. But I say Laura, Laura Riley, uh, one of, uh, who's sitting in one of the global audiences, has asked um, by Slido, is enough attention given to scientific ev evidence when formulating climate change policy? So she's asking the question from the other point of view. In your experience, do governments and the government officials with whom you travel to Kyoto, do they, do they pay enough attention to the scientific evidence? Do you think they understand enough about the scientific evidence to pay it attention? <laughs> uh, well, there's a range of, you know, range of interest and expertise amongst, amongst the politicians. Really, I suppose the only politician that I worked with was the Minister for, for the Environment. And uh, he's a lawyer by training, or what? was a lawyer by training, he is a lawyer by training, and he mastered his brief pretty quickly, I must say. Um, politicians obviously have to cover a lot of ground, so you can't expect them to be as well informed as, as scientists in this particular area. But in, I must say that in general, the ones that I've worked with have generally been better informed than the general population. But that's not necessarily a uh, not necessarily a good source of comparison in the sense that the general population doesn't usually have much access to source material and usually the opinions that the general population have have come from uh, come pre-digested by others in, in sort of a, in a chain of chain of command so those are words but There are very few people you deal with in the area who have actually read the original papers. Usually people rely on what other people tell them. And uh, you, you have to hope that the politicians have got good advisors who do get to the basic literature. And uh, frankly, there's usually not time. They don't usually have time. They're usually, usually careering from one crisis to another crisis and I don't think that they get the time to do what most of them would like to do which is to get on top of a brief in, in great detail. So in answer to the question I think climate change like any other issue does not receive the full, the full advice, the full attention that it deserves but I don't think that climate change research is any any different from any other issue in, the, in that regard. I think we just generally, politicians are just gen generally very busy people. So the question is, how do, they, how do, they, how do we make that sure that, they, that, that their decisions are well informed? And I, I guess that's probably the mo most important question. How do we get well informed people giving advice to politicians, and I guess different countries have different ways of doing it. I mean, the UK here and Australia has a chief scientist who usually has a person of some experience who can draw experts in particular areas to meet with uh, government bodies. They, they're usually competing, competing departments dealing with climate change. So I mentioned earlier on in 1997 how uh, the Department of Environment and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade were not exactly cooperating on the, on the topic because each had different aims. And so you have to hope that the various views that, the, that scientists themselves have and that, the pop, and that the population has are represented up through these government departments. Now, of course, more directly for scientists, we have things like in Australia, the Australian Academy of Science, or the US, the National Academy of Sciences, or 
the Royal Society here in the UK. They too can make their, their representations. Uh, there's lots of different av avenues for doing it. And I guess you... I mean, I've been lucky in a way because I had access to talking to senior people without having it filtered and explained by others. And maybe that's, maybe that's what I don't like about the summary for policymakers that I read from the IPCC, because it's somebody else's interpretation of the science that I think I know more about. Um, it, is, it, is a, it is a vexed question, and I presume the same thing must be true of economics and uh, individual liberty and all the other issues that politicians have to, have to deal with. So, yes, we should try to get more information and better information to politicians, and no, they don't have all the information and the best advice that they need, but I think that's probably true of every other aspect of parliamentary democracy as well. Thank you very much. Next question. Next reflection. Yeah. Great. You, want to jump in as well? you mentioned about funding for pure science. And are we in a situation with globalization of information that motivation for governments to really invest in this has to be declining? You know, if you go back to after the Second World War, there was a huge advantage in having the best nuclear physicists, etc., people who would both be developing new science that could be exploited in, in defense, in your national industries. And you demonstrated in your work that some of the work you were doing in the 60s and 70s took three or four years to emerge. You know, if you were today, your preprint would be out there on the web for everybody to see. So. You know, we were in a situation where investing in pure science was also had a very strong national interest. Today, it, it's largely global. And are, are we going to be in a position where governments are still willing to put in, invest in pure science for global public good rather than for national public mm. good? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, Steve. And can, I, and can I ask you, Graham, when you're speaking to, you know, the, the, the people who come to the Blavatnik School to study or to come as senior leaders in government, you told us in your lecture that the potential upper bound is infinity you know, for, <laughs> for what basic science wants. Um, so, but what would, what, so what would you be saying to them? There's a plea that for, the, for enough, but actually enough is infinity. So, so what... How should policymakers make that trade-off? Hmm. Well, I think through the Royal Society will presumably have spoken, advise, given advice to the to the present government that uh, it's not just the work done by UK scientists that that needs to be captured, because as you say, that's going to be captured by the world. But it's, un it's not captured by every country in the world. It's only captured by those countries in the world who have experts that can use the knowledge. And so I think the big, if I were crafting an argument, Steve, the argument I'd craft is that governments have to pay to have access to the expertise, somebody who can interpret the results of uh, experiments that have you know, been done around the world. And I mean, I think, I don't know whether you would agree, but I think usually you have to have an expert to actually understand the results of what some other expert has, has, has published. I, mean, I guess it's not always true, but it, my impression in biology at least, that to take advantage of biological discoveries, you really need well-trained biologists to do that. And so, so my advice to people who are studying, you know, how to put uh, money into budgets, is that they need to allow enough money to have expertise in areas that they think are uh, a central interest to the country involved. And so even though I was a bit cynical before about mapping of scientific interests and priorities and so on, I do think that governments need to be aware of, 
of those kinds of issues. I was skeptical because I thought it wasn't a, a thorough job and it wasn't, it wasn't a, a representation that really should change year by year as, as you know, not just a map, a map, a map you move through a map and you see changing fields and changing environments. This, this, this Australian mapping exercise was a static view. So, and so you would expect then that the countries like Australia, UK and so on would have some broad view of where they needed to, to invest, to get, to understand information that's being produced worldwide in that, in that area. It doesn't, doesn't help with the budget, I guess. Um, I mean, mostly with budgets, things just emerge from a mixture of history and, and uh, pressure from party rooms and the electorate. I mean, personally, I could imagine a world with a lot more money being spent on science in the same way that we would spend it on, on the arts, because it's a fine thing to do. And so I'm one of those people who'd quite like to see the number go up. But I, but I see it as a sort of a human activity that's more valuable than a lot of other things we spend our money on. But I have to take, I, I do apologize, I can't give you a, a good answer quantitatively about what the, the budget should actually be. Does anybody else have a suggestion? <laughs> Next question, Richard Ruskin. Yes, it's just coming. I'm not sure I have a, is it on? You I'm not sure I really have a suggestion, but I must say I'm surprised to hear you say that if science were funded at the level of the arts, the funding would go up. Uh, oh no 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 no! I said, like in the arts, it should. They both should go up. They both should go up. Of course they should. <laughs> but will they ever? And I wonder if uh, you're not making the assumption that all parties are negotiating in good faith about all of this, and whether it's possible to make that assumption in the case of politicians who are primarily concerned with maintaining themselves in office or in power, and therefore have more pressing concerns than the future. Uh, they're interested in the present. It seems to me that's the basic uh, conflict of interest we have to deal with now mm. and I'm not sure anybody's going to listen to the likes of you or me when we talk about uh, the future of the common good which is the whole objective of the Kyoto Prize. Mm. You sound a bit more optimistic than I'm feeling is what I'm trying to say. Mm. Well I am a bit more optimistic than, than, than what you just said then Richard in the sense that my dealings with politicians haven't been as negative as, as, as you sounded. I think usually most politicians sort of have given up a lot to work and get where they've gotten. I, I say most politicians. Um, and usually they've got some, there is still some idealism there. But they too feel constrained in, in the way that I mentioned they often have to justify what they'd like to spend money on. They've got to justify it through, well, other bodies within the government, like Treasury or Finance or whatever. But more generally, they've got to, they've, they actually have to persuade the electorate. So in the long run, it's really a matter of what people like us, talking with our friends and discussing with, uh, strangers. In the long run it's us as an, as an educated electorate that have to give better ideas to politicians of how to spend the money than, than occurs at present. I, I, I sort of feel as if I didn't answer Steve's question very well um, and certainly one of, the, one of the chief scientists we had in Australia, I won't, I won't name him, but one of the chief scientists we had in Australia a few years ago said that maybe we should not think about the Israeli mode of, of you know, we're going to go strongly into 
computing or we're going to go strongly into quantum something or other, whatever. He said, the evidence seems to be that what works for the economy and therefore for a lot of other aspects of what governance is about comes not from actually primarily doing the research oneself but of uh, being a fast follower, as he put it. If something's invented in Oxford, make bloody sure that the people in Canberra know about it really quickly. And um, I suppose that's why I formed the view that e even if he is right about that, you need somebody in Canberra who understands what that Oxford scientist has, has done. And to actually get that understanding, in general, you have to do research. So even if you take that really pragmatic, non-idealistic view of the world to say that we only will support research just so that we can grab what other people have learned, even if you have that view, you end up, if you're being pragmatic, you end up having to support good scientists because they're the ones that will make expert evaluation and stop you from going down the wrong track. <laughs> We have another question from yes. our global audience. Yes, Graham. Um, one of the international participants, Jan Druk, has said, and this is a scientific question, could you explain about your discoveries relating to wind speed and evaporation and what our expectations might be for climate change? Oh, yeah. Well, the observations are that pan evaporation rate, which is what happened, the evaporation rate from a pan, it's just in concept, it's quite simple. You put out a pan of water, come back again at 9 o'clock next morning and see how much it's lost. And, you know, they do it with a lot of precision and care. And that, that rate is measured by countries around the world, but not very much by the UK because John Monteith saw that this is a very complicated physical problem and he preferred to calculate it. And so in the UK it's done by calculation. But anyway, the rest of the world has pan evaporation measurements going on in great detail even though the theory it was first worked out here in the UK. And those, those measurements show that on a, on a decadal scale, the, the evaporation from, rate from pans has actually been going down. And this just seems strange in a world that, you, that is, you know, you think of global warming, people, people assume global warming is the same as global drying. And the two things are not the same that when you think about it. I mean, for example, within Australia, Alice, well, Darwin in the north is, is, more, is warmer than Alice Springs in the centre, but there's sure a lot more evaporation from Alice Springs than there is from Darwin. In other words, it, it depends on the humidity. And so for a while people wondered whether it's because the humidity is going up in some way. But just as, I don't know how you do your washing in here in the various audiences we have, but. If you hang it out in the clothesline, you'll see it evaporates much more, it dries much more quickly when there's a wind. And uh, so wind movement of air plays a big role in, in evaporation. And uh, you can show that, that for, for leaves, but it's also true for a pan. A pan is basically a leaf with no cuticle. And uh, so pan evaporation is going, has been going down in uh, many parts of the world uh, because wind speed's been going down. To give, you, to give you a rough feel for it, in Australia it's been going down by one centimetre a second per year. One centimetre a second. Are you, are you in feet here? No. I think we can stick with the SI units. <laughs> anyway, so one centimetre is about 0.4 of an inch less each year. But what does that give you much feel for it? Well, the answer is that the, the average wind speed in Australia is two metres a second. And so in 30 years, at one centimetre a second per year, that's 30 centimetres a second, or 0.3 metres a second less after three decades uh, out of two metres a second. So that's a 15% reduction in wind speed. 
Now the question, that, which is a really good one, which is why is that so? And we don't really know. I mean, I think at a course level you can say things like the greenhouse effect is expected in some ways to actually smear out temperature differences in the, on the globe. You expect the, the poles to, in the long run, poles to warm more than the equator and so on. And so you might expect that the large scale large scale air movements might be decreased if the if the gradients in temperature are diminished by climate change. So that's one sort of plausible overarching theory. But uh, the the models, the general circulation models, the global climate models as they're called, they do predict some reduction in wind speed, but nothing of the magnitude that's actually been observed. And the, the fascinating thing is that the wind speed over the ocean is actually going up. And uh, at first I thought, well, that's just because they can't measure it. You know, over the ocean, when they measure wind speed, they do it by looking at, looking from down from satellites at the, at the waves. And so it seems a lot less direct than having an anemometer like we would do over land. But uh, I think that they are right and that wind speed is not going down over, over the ocean. I say that because if you look at carefully at the observations of places like Canada and other places, you see that the wind speed decline is greatest in areas that have greatest continent, continentality, in other words, away from the ocean. As you, as you get closer to the ocean, you find that the, the wind speed is reducing less and less until that the ocean reverses sign. What does it mean for climate? Um, I, so it's obviously going to depend on what I mean, it'll have effects of its own in the sense that there's, you know, presumably less, slightly less dust, slightly less turbulence and so on. But I think probably the more interesting question is what it means, what it, in terms of what it means for the climate is what's the underlying cause of it? And, uh, you know, after we published these results, colleagues in Paris, uh, Philip C.S. and friends, published a paper in Nature suggesting that it was because the Earth's becoming rougher. There are more trees growing because of the increased CO2 levels. And he, they calculated and suggested that this increased roughness because of increased vegetation was somehow slowing down the wind. I'm pretty skeptical about that, personally. But uh, that was one other, you know, vaguely mechanistic explanation and if, if that were the explanation then the implications would not be so great but I, because I think it's unlikely to be the, the true explanation there's a possibility that something quite deep and meaningful <laughs> will come out of it once we do understand it. Are there any meteorologists here? No. No. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Can, can, I, can I ask you, 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 at the beginning of your lecture, you said as a young man you wanted to make the desert bloom. Hmm. Are, we, are we getting, I, I flew back from North Africa yesterday, it strikes me as very, very important for huge regions of the world. Where have we got to on that? Have you given up on that? Or are we getting closer? I've just become much more politically correct. <laughs> it's a value judgment to, to go into a desert ecosystem with so, to the desert ecologist and say, we'd like to solve your problems. Mm -hmm. They say, well, we like it like this. And I, I was in, I, actually after, uh, after the laureate meeting in uh, San Diego, I went in, into, the, into the desert with Joe Berry, who uh, worked with me on the theories of photosynthesis, but also on the theories of carbon isotope discrimination. Anyway, Joe and his wife, Lise, took me to the desert, and Joe loves the desert. He loves it. And I just can't imagine him being very impressed by turning it all into uh, sunflower or... <laughs> so that... Thank you. <laughs> no, but that, that's, a, that's a glib sort of a response. There, are, there, there have been discoveries, and there, and there are important discoveries for, for a number of areas of crop improvement. And crop, you know, crop improvement is going on every year by a small amount. 
and uh, it gives me optimism that if we stick to it, if we stick to the research in this area, that we will continue to improve crop yields in areas that are stressed either by saline soils or, or lack of rain. Um, so I am optimistic that, that things will keep improving. It's a bit like um, you know, record, Olympic records for the mile, or I guess we don't call it the mile anymore, but you see it in swimming, the, the records keep going down. It just doesn't seem possible that they, they, should be, they should be stationary, you'd think, but they don't. They keep going down. And I think yields, I think agronomists and plant breeders will be successful in increasing yields for some time. Now the question is whether they they do it fast enough and enough, uh, you know, efficiently enough. I'm not sure, but um, I think we will get improvements, but only if we make the investment. And um, I, I I did follow up on some of these things before because there's there's some debate in the plant biology area about about this when you. If you're working in an area that, you, that involves improving yield of some crop, what do you do to get the attention of people who give the money? Or the people who give the money to the people who give the money? There's, this, there's an awful temptation to promise more than you can deliver. And so I worried about that. And so I went to, to see economists and other people about exactly what we could do in terms of feeding the world and uh, biofuels and so on. And uh, the answer is that science is part of that process. We may not be able to deliver all the progress that's needed because in many cases, at least in Australia, if the, if the, uh, if the value of a commodity were increased, the price were increased, then people would just plant more of that crop. So there's a lot of, do you call it elasticity, do you? Mm -hmm. um, so farmers are quite responsive to, to financial squeezing or, or, or the reverse. But nevertheless, I didn't, I, of all the economists that I spoke to, not one said that it was just accepted that that was part of the, of the market process, that, that uh, people would benefit from more research that people would uh, therefore pay for it and so that research would be paid for, whether by private means or, or by government. So, although I, get, I feel a little bit uncomfortable about what I regard sometimes as extravagant promises for crop improvement, I do feel satisfied in my own mind that it's, it's legitimate that science plays a role in that and that it be recognized and that you just would like, you would like it that it's other people would say, well, of course, we don't need you to make your case because it's obvious, but unfortunately, these things are not always obvious. Thank you. This morning, you've opened up your area of science to us beautifully, but you've, and you've also told us um, your kind of personal trip and what, what I'm sure has struck a lot of us is your amazing, I mean, like the leaves that you study that kind of diffuse carbon CO2 in, but keep their own moisture. You, you keep your own balance in the face of these, these you know, the, the professor that told you that your maths was terminal, the, the exam results that, that were very disappointing to you, the, the feedback that you got that perhaps you might not make it as a scientist, the fact that you, that you took up classical ballet in a country that celebrates rugby, you know, it's, there's a, I guess my question, because there was a sort of murmur of, among the, the, the scholars and such like present, how is it that you retain that balance when you get that exam result or the professor that tells you that you're not going to make it as a scientist? How, what is it that you tell yourself at that moment that keeps you going, that's kept you going to achieve the highest level? That's very kind of you. <laughs> um, I mean, in the later part of my career, I was really lucky because I got recognition. And so I would 
listen to those people who thought I was good and ignore those people who thought I was bad. <laughs> but that doesn't help you at the beginning. No, that, that's, that's a silly answer. I do, I do think it comes back to some of the principles that uh, Dr. Inamori has spoken about and what I spoke about at the end. I mean, you can't rely on other people's view of the quality of your work if you don't yourself put all your effort into making it as good as it can be and reading what other people have done historically and comparing your results with other, what other people have done. If, you, if you've done something to the best of your ability, and that gives a certain confidence, I think. Mm -hmm. um, also, I suppose it probably sounds a bit corny, but if you've got a secure home life, I think that if you've had parents that are supportive and friends and family more generally that are supportive, that's a great blessing. Mm -hmm. um, obstinacy, maybe. <laughs> Richard and I have talked about the selfishness of uh, academics, and Richard tells me it's nothing compared to the selfishness of composers. <laughs> and uh, I presume that they've, they go through the same process even more, in, more intensely. I, and maybe, not, maybe it's a small thing, but the very act of doing ballet and, as well as science does give some balance to your life. Mm -hmm. So, so I, as a PhD student and, and subsequently, you know, I, I worked quite, quite well because I knew that there was a class at six o'clock or whatever and a rehearsal at 7.30, um, which is quite, first of all, physical, so, so got you fit, but there was music and drama and, you know, all the social interactions that go into any activity. And it meant that it clean, cleaned my mind out. I wasn't sort of thinking about some slight that I might have received about my work or some problem that was uh, pressing in that way. So I think, I think having a, a life outside science or outside academic Other, uh, other aspects of academia, I think having an outside life interest can help shore you up against the inevitable misfortunes that come along in, in, in any... There's always going to be misfortunes if you take risks and there's no point in going to try to be a good scientist if, you, if you're not prepared to take risks and of course inevitably with risks you, some of them fail so there has, there has to be this, this acceptance that, uh, that there'll be failure and you've got to make sure that you, we don't judge ourselves or indeed others around us, particularly others who we have to assess for promotion or reward in some other ways. We have to be really careful not to misjudge people just because they've been daring and have failed in daring things. Um, so that's just a meandering answer, I'm sorry. Thank Can I just you. pick up on that a little bit, though? Um, the world changes. You seem to have had a, a huge amount of fun, <laughs> particularly in the early part of your career. Do you think that option is still there for people in a madly competitive world as they try to establish themselves and do their good science? Well, George, part of what I spoke about today was, was a question about the way we fund science I mean, I think there has to be a range of ways of funding science, and I think that that was, what, that was what I was getting at when I talked about having a biodiversity of, of approaches. But the interesting thing is that I work in a building called the R. N. Robertson Building. Bob Robertson was a famous scientist who's a bit unlucky not to get the Nobel Prize. He worked at the same time as Mitchell on, the, on how mitochondria work and things like that. And there was a debate in Australia at the time, in, in, I guess the 1950s or 60s, I'm not quite sure exactly when. There's a debate about how funding should work. 
the existing feeling had been that money went directly to universities from the government, and Bob Robertson pushed this new method, this new approach, which was that you had competition, so that people all over the country could compete for the same amount of money. And of course, that that won out. But I wonder whether it's necessarily true for everybody. I wonder whether giving a mix of processes might be better because for somebody like me, I, uh, I think as I made it, made it obvious in my speech, I like the idea of not having to worry about grant applications. Um, I, the system had to be one where you didn't have much money because you can't just change field and assume that more money is going to come. But it did mean that I could quickly shift around when somebody, when I saw some possibility for, a, for an idea. So that's something that within the, the existing budgetary constraints that we have, I think we could uh, make more efficient use of human time in that regard. I'll give you as an example um, uh, the famous American ecologist who used to visit Canberra quite regularly. And for his part of the NSF funding, there was a system where they agreed that they would, they would fund him in advance, always. All he had to do was write a report on what had happened, not, not what he wanted to do, because his record was so good that everybody, everybody accepted that he was creative and, and uh, productive guy. I think I deserve something like that. <laughs> but I think, I mean, I'm being, being facetious, but I think there's room for a, for a system where people get reviewed after the fact and given a long lead time, not necessarily with a lot of money, but just enough so that they can get on with it and quickly shift as scientific fields shift, rather than having to wait the typically one or two years that that we presently have because of uh, the requirements of, of, of the grants. But George, you, you probably, with, with referring to other aspects of international uh, the changes in the, in the conditions for scientific work, a lot of them, I don't know whether you got this impression, but I do believe that in some senses, we senior scientists have made a rod for our own backs. That with every good intention, of increasing the money coming to our field, we've, we've said, we've, we've scratched our heads and said, how can we give, convince them to give us more money? And then we think of some new topic, or I know our work hasn't been directed enough at national priorities. So we'll, we'll identify national priorities and say we'll work for national priorities if you give, it, and you give us more money. Well, so what happens is that now, in every grant proposal in Australia, you have to write down and say how it is that you're meeting national priorities. And the priorities are so big you can drive trucks through the, <laughs> through the, through the priorities. Um, is that the sort of thing you're thinking about or something different? Well, it is one of the ways in which the world has changed, which makes it yeah. harder and harder for scientists to do what they want to do, which is science. Yes. Wonderful, and I think it's a, lovely, it's a lovely lesson for us here in school as well about how we couch our arguments to governments and others and how that might end up shaping what we do ourselves. Um, I'd like you to join me, um, Mrs. Inamori Kin Kanazawa, Mr. Himeda, your wonderful team, um, George Ratcliffe and the, our colleagues in the plant science, sciences could you all join me and those of you in other countries in thanking uh, George, um, Professor Farquhar just for a wonderful lecture this morning. I think you've made those of us who are non-scientists excited about the science you do, but you've also, I think, inspired everybody in the room about the way that setbacks can actually make each of us stronger. And, um, and so we should just keep on with it. So thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much.
if you would like to rejoin us at 11.45 for the next Laureate Lecture. Thank you. You're very kind. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful.